Hello everyone and welcome to our Pro Training Technical Webinar featuring Brian Mount from FMC. Before we start, I'd like to review a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Here's a quick review of what you'll see on your screen. To the left of your screen is the viewer where you see the presentation. To the right is the control panel where you can ask questions. The control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. To keep it open, click the View menu and uncheck Auto Hide Control Panel. You have joined this webinar in listen-only mode, which means you are muted. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will address them during the Q&A session at the end. Later today, you will receive a follow-up email containing the webinar recording. With that, let me introduce you to today's speaker. Brian has worked in several different management positions in the pest control industry. His varied experiences with FMC have given him a unique insight into the types of issues, both positive and negative, that pest professionals deal with daily. Brian is FMC's Technical Service Manager for all insecticides nationwide. Brian, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, today, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about Scion uh, and mosquitoes and maybe some, uh, some quick tips to help save uh, some money by using Scion in your, your mosquito program. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. So our agenda today, um, we're gonna do a quick safety share, um, then a little bit about mosquitoes, and then a little bit about Scion, uh, and then also um, some on our True Champions program. And then if you have any questions uh, or feedback, you know, feel free to uh, put questions in the, uh, the chat as well, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. So our safety share, and this is something FMC does with every meeting, um, because you know without being safe, you know we we really are are um, not doing ourselves any any good, um, ourselves or our families. So safety has to be top of mind. And one that came up recently for me is the use of backup cameras. So we all have, probably all of us have a backup camera in our vehicle. And I was actually in a parking space at a shopping center. Um, it was one of those one-way aisles. So every aisle goes one direction and you park on an angle. So I was parked there, getting ready to back out, put the car in reverse, looked at the camera, and a car was coming up the aisle behind me, and then it stopped. So it looked like it was letting me back out. Um, fortunately, though, I looked in my mirror and the car was still going past. So I didn't back out just by using the what I saw on the camera. And what had happened was the camera froze at the moment that car was about 15, 20 feet um, before reaching my spot. So again, just looking at the camera, I would have thought it was gonna let me back out and take my spot. Um, camera froze, looked like it stopped, but it really didn't. So use, you know, use your mirrors, you know, look back as well. Don't just count on the camera. Don't just count on the mirrors. Don't just count on looking. Really use all of those when, um, uh, you know, backing up or, or really doing any kind of maneuver with your vehicle. You use everything that you can, just don't count on one. So, um, and that camera actually stayed frozen where I saw that image for about five minutes, even after I pulled out of the spot and left. So technology can freeze up on you and uh, just don't let it get you into an accident. So that's the safety share. Um, move on to a little bit on mosquito uh, biology uh, and control. So again, we'll go over a little bit on, on their life cycle, um, some of the differences between some of the species and, and why that's important, and then a few other things as well. So I think we've all probably seen this before, right? Um, so you have your adult mosquito, they lay eggs uh, in water, uh, they hatch out to a larva, they turn into a pupa, and then they emerge as adult mosquitoes. So really the immature stages of the mosquito are aquatic, um, which you know could be a, a potential uh, revenue generator for some of you, you know, if you have the right licenses where you can treat water uh, for mosquitoes, um, 
you know, with appropriate, you know, larvicides, things like that, uh, maybe something to, uh, to look into as well. But really, they start out in water, and then the adults are the ones that come out and, uh, and attack us. Um, quick shot, this is a Culex uh, laying egg rafts. So if there are, you know, water sources around a, a customer's home, you can look for things like these egg rafts. If it's a Culex laying it, uh, other species will lay single eggs. Uh, some of them will have little floats on the side as well. But again, this can be a real good indicator of, of where the problem is originating. It's again, they have to start out, you know, in some, some type of water. So again, uh, this is also a good way to tell potentially what species you're dealing with. Um, you know, Culex lays these rafts, the 80s species uh, lay single eggs, um, Anopheles lay a single egg with floats on the side of it. So again, you can kind of tell species somewhat by looking at these eggs. Uh, this is what the larvae look like. So call them wigglers as well. So they're probably about a quarter inch long at, at max. Uh, you look down on the water, a lot of times if you just look into that water source and your shadow is enough to cause them to start wiggling and move around, a lot of times they'll just drop to the bottom uh, of that water source. But you know, you can definitely see thousands of these in a something as small as like a jar, for instance, that's holding water. Pupa look like these guys. Sometimes they'll tumble down off the surface if they're disturbed. Um, when you're looking at breeding sites, uh, pretty much anything that holds water is a breeding site for mosquitoes. I think I saw somewhere or read somewhere that old tires are probably one of the number one breeding sites uh, for mosquitoes as far as anything artificial. Um, they hold water, they're shaded, they're protected. Um, and again, mosquitoes just love to breed in those. And we all know there's plenty of old tires sitting around, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, but they are there. Uh, you know, if you see something like uh, the picture on the left here at a customer's home, uh, again, a lot of things here that can, could hold water. Um, see if I can get my pointer to work. So something like this bowl or this, I don't even know if that's a little, uh, colander or something, but it has a rim on the edge on the back, so it's upside down, but that little edge can hold water. Tarps can hold water within them. Of course, the tires. This is an old, looks like an old crib, probably aligned with some type of a waterproof uh, membrane. That can hold water. A wheelbarrow back here, and then who knows what else is in there. So really good breeding sites uh, for mosquitoes and also harbored for tons of other pests. Uh, if you see sites like this, you know, maybe a good idea, uh, obviously point it out to the homeowner, the property owner. Um, and then again, could be another gen uh, revenue generator if uh, you have the ability to clean up some of those sites. It's going to help your treatment, number one, maybe help out the customer as well, and hopefully uh, maybe generate some, uh, some income as well. Um, so water, you know, on the banks of rivers and, and near larger water bodies, obviously breeding areas as well. Uh, things like glass jars or tin cans that can hold water. These are all, all breeding areas uh, for mosquitoes. So if you see them, dump them out you know, on a property if you can. If there's just too many, just uh, ask the homeowner to have it cleaned up uh, and removed, and uh, that'll help them with the mosquito problem. So again, anything that retains water uh, is a potential uh, mosquito breeding site. So you know, bird baths, uh, trash piles, um, rain gauges and even gutters, right? So if the gutters are clogged on a house, say they're stopped up with debris, um, it could be a breeding site for mosquitoes as well. So uh, don't forget to look up. Uh, then there's, you know, things like fish ponds. You know, we want to make sure that when we treat uh, with an adulticide that we are avoiding anything like fish ponds or, you know, um, say bird baths to some degree, and then also, um, pet bowls, things like that. So we want to make sure we avoid them. Um, and then again, most things on here, you know, you can you can basically uh, point them out to homeowners as well. Some quick facts on mosquitoes, uh, about 3,000 different species in the world. Uh, males don't bite. Uh, the females do. So the females are the ones that are biting us. The males typically will, will feed on pollen and nectar, kind of getting a quick energy source so they can uh, you know, breed with the females. Uh, females do bite us to get protein, uh, get that blood meal for their egg development. 
Uh, again, they both do feed on nectar uh, for energy. Attracted the CO2 from about 100 to 150 feet away, so they can find you from, from quite a distance. Um, the female, you know, can pump your skin or process, take a blood meal. Uh, they can also transmit disease. I think that's one of the things that, you know, most folks um, probably think about when they're thinking about having mosquito treatment done. Um, you know, a few years ago, Zika was in the headlines and it seemed like everybody wanted you to just come out and just nuke, nuke their property for mosquitoes. They didn't care what you use, they didn't care, you know, what had to be done. But that little bit of a scare on Zika really uh, prompted people to do, do more mosquito treatments. Um, when there's diseases like West Nile virus that are here all the time. And it doesn't get that frenzy. Um, and I think it was all the sensationalism around that. So I guess good for the industry, but uh, you don't want the disease transmission uh, you know, to happen. So that definitely was not good. Uh, so a little bit on some of the mosquitoes and, and sometimes, you know, folks say, well, why do I care? You know, it's a mosquito. I just want to treat it and, uh, and that's it. But it, you do need to know I think some basics on, on some of the different species or groups that you'll see. Uh, Culex is one, so this is your northern house or southern house mosquito. Pretty widely distributed. Uh, we saw this one laying the eggs in the rafts. Um, and they'll lay eggs in temporary groundwater uh, from fresh water to polluted water, they really don't care. Um, artificial containers, all that good stuff, tires. Uh, the larvae are vertical in the water, perpendicular to the surface. Uh, adults rest with their body flat to the surface. Um, but one of the keys with Culex, they do tend to feed higher in the canopy. So think 15 to 25 feet high uh, for adults. Uh, they are the West Nile vector uh, or one of the West Nile vectors here, but the main one uh, in the US. And to give you an idea of, you know, where they're found. So we know they do rest up and feed up higher in the canopy and they feed on birds as well as people. So this was one study done by the CDC looking at trap counts where they looked at you know near the ground or up in the canopy and what they were finding was the majority were captured up 15 to 25 feet up. So that's where the, that's where the adults are resting, that's where they're doing some of their feeding. Um, so 840 caught, I believe this was a single night, versus 31 at ground level. Uh, why that's important, if you're doing a mosquito treatment, what are you targeting? You know, what type of resting areas? Typically, we're looking at the vegetation, ground level up to maybe the soffit level of the house on the first floor, for instance. So you're really only going up maybe about 10, 12 feet when these guys, the majority are up 15 feet or higher. So something to really consider. Uh, and I would say, especially if you're having callbacks or some issues at a, at a property, um, you know, maybe try to identify which one you're dealing with. Is it Culex? Uh, because if it is, you may have to target a little bit higher. Uh, distribution of Culex, again, they're pretty much uh, throughout the US, a couple different species, but uh, they do tend to uh, inhabit most of, really most of North America. Moving on to uh, the 80s Aegypti, this is your yellow fever mosquito. Um, these guys are that dark black in color. They do have these white bands on their legs. Um, and Aegypti, on the front of the thorax here, you have this kind of, I want to say almost like a violin des design. Um, and that's really important only to distinguish it from 80s Albopictus, which has a little different design on the front. And I'll show that in a few slides. Um, but again, this one is also a Zika uh, vector as well. So these guys, they love to deposit eggs in those artificial containers. Um, you know, some of the uh, surface waters as well. Uh, winter uh, has passed in the egg stage, uh, but you know, down here I'm in Florida, so we really don't have a winter uh, to really speak of. So they can pretty much be continuous throughout the entire year. Um, you know, I see mosquitoes in January, February, December, it doesn't really matter. Uh, eggs will remain viable and will hatch after being held for over a year, so pretty hardy. Um, these guys, uh, you know, you'll find them in these tree holes and those artificial containers as far as the wiggler stage or larval stages, um, and pretty much anywhere around the, around the structure. 
Um, these guys are very wary feeders, so they often attack around the ankles. Um, they even crawl under the clothing to find a good spot to feed. Um, they feed in the shade during the daytime. So this is a daytime feeder. Um, they will feed at night uh, in, inside the house where it's lit up. Uh, they do prefer you know, humans to really other animals. Uh, and they will rest indoors. Uh, they'll come inside. They'll, they're happy to stay inside. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story about uh, 80s. So we went away on vacation. We were gone about two weeks. Uh, came back, and I guess uh, a female uh, mosquito or two had gotten into the house uh, before we left. And one of our uh, downstairs uh, guest bathrooms um, lifted up the toilet seat. And believe it or not, they were larva mosquito, larval mosquitoes actually in, in the toilet bowl itself. So again, they're not very picky. Um, and if they do get inside, you know, they're they're happy to stay and even can reproduce inside if things are left undisturbed. Um, so these guys never really fly more than a few hundred feet from where they hatched. Uh, they can do that. They can go much further for sure, but typically they're staying fairly close to that water source if, if food is readily available. Um, so this gives you an idea of where uh, 80s was. This is a little bit older map from CDC 2007. I think I have an updated one in here as well. Uh, this is 80s albopictus. And if you remember with the 80s aegypti, that kind of violin shape here, this one just has pretty much a white uh, stripe or white mark uh, there as well. This is your Asian tiger mosquito. Um, these guys, you know, deposit their eggs just above the water level or on the surface. Uh, winter is passed in the egg stage. Uh, this is a domestic species. They prefer the artificial breeding sites uh, provided by us. Uh, tires, tarps, all that good stuff. Jars. And then uh, tree holes. And you also can think about, you know, around the structure, if you're seeing any kind of depressions that could hold water in the future, uh, those should be leveled out, filled in. So if there's tire ruts or something like that, that once it rains, they fill up with water. Um, that's enough for the mosquitoes to uh, to breathe there, for the eggs to hatch in that, and um, you know potentially cause an issue. So if those areas can be filled in, uh, leveled off, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, these guys are also a persistent, painful daytime biter. So we've seen now with two of these, uh, both of the 80 species, that they're daytime biters. So if your customers complain they're getting bit during the day, very good chance it's uh, one of the 80s uh, species. Um, let's see. Um, this one, you know, Albopictus has kind of taken over some of the range of uh, 80s aegypti over time as it's kind of progressed into the U.S. Uh, it's a weak but uh, speedy uh, flyer, also a very shy mosquito, um, tends to bite you many times in a short period of time. Uh, you know, again, if you move, she's going to move um, and then may bite again. Uh, biting below the waist and spends much of her time over vegetation in our backyards. So, again, very different than what we saw with Culex, which is up higher in the canopy. These guys rest in that lower vegetation. So here was uh, Albopictus in 07. Um, and then here's really the range of both of the 80s. Um, so Albopictus and Aegypti, um, with really uh, Albopictus being this green, really taking over a lot of the range where uh, Aegypti was established several, I guess, decades ago, if you will. Um, so I think you see a little bit more of uh, Albopictus and Aegypti these days, but both are. Uh, threats to humans. So uh, I would say it doesn't really matter which one, they're both there. So uh, a little bit on Anopheles. So um, Anopheles, uh, these are um, really your malaria mosquitoes. Uh, they do rest, I'm gonna go back one slide here, um, with their abdomen kind of pointed up at a pretty discreet angle or pretty uh, obtuse angle to the surface. So this is how they rest, where the others kind of rest flat. So a good way to tell the difference. Um, their eggs do have floats on either side, like we uh, like we already talked about. Um, they can't survive drying out or desiccation, so those eggs won't survive if they dry out. Um, larva are horizontal in the water, uh, where they uh, filter feed. They don't possess a breathing siphon like other um, mosquitoes, 
So they obtain oxygen really right through their abdomen. Uh, they do overwinter as fertilized females in uh, colder climates. You know, some of the other species we saw overwintered as eggs. Um, so what they'll do is they'll get into these protected areas. So whether it's in you know, a barn, a tree hole, um, maybe under siding, just somewhere where it's dark and protected. Uh, and these guys feed at dusk and dawn. So again, a little bit different than we saw with 80s. And that could be something that can help you identify what species you are dealing with. They are the malaria vector. You can see there's a lot of different anopheline uh, species. Um, you can see pretty much half the US, uh, eastern half uh, has tons of uh, anopheline uh, mosquitoes. Uh, then the rest of the world as well. So mosquitoes, you know, they can uh, transmit disease. So anything from malaria to dengue to West Nile to Zika uh, to uh, cephalitis as well. So lots of different diseases that they can vector. And really that's why uh, they're a concern. So when you look at, you know, just a, a sample type home, you know, where are you going to treat? So you look at this house, you say, okay, normal, typical home. So areas you want to treat are this lower uh, vegetation for sure, maybe up under the soffits. So you think, you know, shady, cool areas, uh, that's where the mosquitoes are going to rest. You know, more shrubs over here, maybe there when that grows in, up under the porch ceiling as well. Um, you know, you get a little bit outside of the structure, you know, you've got areas like here. Now, some states may have requirements that, hey, if you're treating more than 10 feet away, uh, you have to have a TNO license. So again, what I would say is just check uh, with your state to see what those regulations are, because every state's a little bit different. Um, and then over here as well, soffits, shrubs, you know, uh, any, any kind of shady areas um, you know, where they're going to hang out. Now, you know, I do get a lot of questions, you know, do you need to treat out in the yard, so the lawn itself? Uh, for the most part, that answer is no. Um, I know there are some labels um, that do say mosquitoes in the lawn section. Um, you don't need to target the lawn for mosquitoes because typically during the day, it's hot. Uh, it's probably dry in the middle of the lawn. Um, mosquitoes aren't going to rest there, so not a big deal. Now, if you have heavy ground covers, um, like uh, uh, Pachysandra, Ivy, uh, that are shaded, definitely those types of areas. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to go over real quick on, on pitfalls. So what these are is, you know, when you when you get to a property, um, you know, walk that property before you start treatment to identify any kind of any kind of hazards, you know, fish ponds, bird baths, pet food, pets, people, open windows, open wells, you know, toys, um, fruit trees, vegetable gardens. Uh, what I will tell you is that I probably get. I don't know, maybe three or four calls a year, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, about herb gardens. Uh, herb gardens tend to look like not a whole lot. They could just look like weeds to you. Uh, but, you know, I would ask the customer, hey, do you have any vegetable gardens, herb gardens, anything like that? Because uh, we want to avoid those. Because a lot of times what happens is if you do treat them, uh, they've got to be either cut back or removed completely uh, and then replaced. So we don't want to get into those kind of situations. Um, and, you know, again, it's just asking those questions, right? Um, it's just going to save you down the road uh, from any kind of uh, issues. Um, one other, you know, pitfall I'll, I'll add here um, is make sure you're at the right property. It sounds kind of, I don't know, uh, kind of dumb, but, uh, you know, I'll get several calls a year from, uh, companies where they treated the wrong property and they want the customer the, or the homeowner wants it all removed and how do you do that and you know um, it's always that customer that is organic green you name it um, it's always the worst possible one and so double check your property addresses if the people aren't home you know just double and triple check it uh, make sure at the right uh, residence uh, because you don't want to get into those kind of situations either um, you know, I had a, a call a few years ago now where a gentleman was treating for, I don't know if it was mosquitoes or just doing perimeter pests, but he was dragging a hose, doing kind of a power spray, went around the back of the house, around the corner, 
Caps Brian didn't see a gentleman actually on a ladder um, doing some repair on the house. So just soaked them down. Um, so again, not, not good situations that you want to be in. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit to uh, to Scion. So Scion is uh, FMC's newest insecticide um, for uh, for pest control. Uh, it's been out now for a few years, so about three years, I believe, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, so what is it? So Scion with UVX technology. So basically, you have a readily readily available active ingredient for immediate control. Um, you have a defined active ingredient. Uh, release for continuous residual. Um, you have um, a UV protection and you have durability under intense sunlight and on harsh surfaces. So what does that mean? Uh, so that means when you're treating surfaces like concrete, stucco, block, uh, those are very alkaline surfaces that can tend to break down chemistries. Um, but with Scion, you have a built-in uh, protection uh, from that. So it helps it last longer on some of those really hard surfaces um, or harsh surfaces, I should say. Uh, you also have a very, very low use, use rate product. And I believe this is the lowest use rate or use rate on the market. And we'll see some of those rates in a minute. The other thing we, we see with it is um, very little as far as any kind of uh, skin irritation. We've had really no reports of that uh, in the field. So that's a really good thing as well. Um, if you look at gamma sialothrin as an ingredient, um, it's the most active isomer in the sialothrin family of chemistry. Um, allows you to use the lowest rate uh, active ingredient. Provides up to 90 days of uh, true perimeter uh, performance. Um, and really, again, we talked about under some of those harsh conditions. So you get high temperatures, you get concrete or stucco or block. Um, you know, you get high sunlight. Uh, Scion stands up very well. If you look at the use rate, so the low rate, you're at 0.0075%. So that's pretty low. Um, you look at something like Tall Star, typical use rate is 0.06. Um, you get to the mid rate of Scion, you're at 0.015. High rate, you get up to 0.03. So again, lowest use rate, urethra on the market, you're putting less active ingredient in the environment. So that does resonate with some folks, uh, some maybe not, but uh, it is a, a, a good advantage of, of Scion. So, you know, we asked uh, really folks in the field, what do, they, what do they need out there, right? So this is how the UVX technology came about. They wanted a product that worked, you know, today, uh, worked on some of the toughest pests and also gave uh, continuous uh, performance under harsh conditions. And um, that's really what was the driver behind developing the UVX formulation. Uh, so really spent many years putting the right pieces together uh, for this formulation. I can tell you it is the most complex formulation uh, FMC has ever uh, put together. Um, but again, you get multi multiple components here. You get a readily available AI, defined release, AI, UV protection, and that durability under those harsh conditions. So gamma, we talked about this a little bit. It is that lowest use rate pyrethroid. And what you'll see is, you know, in the Silothrin family, uh, you have these different uh, isomers, uh, which are basically just a different configuration of the same um, atoms, uh, if you will, uh, in that molecule. So the active isomer, there's really one, and then the others are fairly inactive as far as activity on pests. So straight silothrin, that's comprised of about 22% of the active isomer, which is this dark uh, color here. You go to lambda silothrin, that's about 42% of the active isomers. You get the gamma, it's about 98% of the active isomers of silothrin. So that's what makes it work well at lower use rates because you have pretty much all active isomer in this formulation. Uh, we talked about the rates a little bit. Use sites, again, uh, pretty standard uh, use sites. Uh, and then as far as application areas, again, pretty standard as far as application areas uh, as well. So you can do parks, recreation areas, around residential, commercial, 
uh, institutional, all those good things. Um, so with Scion, you know, we have uh, three different assurance programs. So we have a perimeter assurance program, which is a 90 day assurance. So if you go out Scion at the right rates, uh, we will give you uh, 90 days of assurance. And if you have a callback in there for any of those pests on the assurance program, uh, we'll give you the product to go do that uh, re reservice. Um, the Scion Mosquito Assurance at 75 days at the high rate uh, of uh, Scion, so the 0.65 fluid ounces per thousand square feet. Uh, we also have a tick assurance program, 75 days um, at the high rate as well. So again, you know, we stand behind the product. Uh, we've got lots of data uh, on these different pests that uh, show 75 day plus. Uh, on uh, mosquito and tick, and then on other pests, you know, 90 days uh, and more. So with Scion, you know, it comes in a quart size. So one quart will make you um, 96 uh, finished gallons at the mid rate and 48 at the high rate. So a little bit on cost there as well. So about a dollar fifty to three dollars per finished gallon. Um, if you look at the cost and use in the assurance program, so at the high rate of Scion, you're at about uh, 309 per finished gallon. There are some other programs out there. Some require the use of an IGR. Uh, when you add that IGR into, again, these other programs, uh, there are 60-day programs out there. Uh, your cost per finished gallon gets up to about $6.63, so more than 2x what Scion would be. And with Scion, you don't need an IGR. Uh, you can surely add it if you want to, but you just really don't need it. Um, looking at a couple different mosquito programs with uh, with Scion, um, you know, some folks don't want to go Scion every single month at that higher rate, which is okay. Um, but if you go Something like this, again, these are just samples, uh, and they also give you a little bit on the cost uh, per thousand to do these. So if you do something like program one here, so you're gonna go Scion at the high rate, then Tall Star in between, uh, and then you know on a quarterly basis, do your Scion, fill in with Tall Star. Really your program cost is about 10 bucks per thousand for the year. So that's the whole length of that program. That's what it's gonna cost you per thousand. Now, I don't wanna say to be fair, but really, you know, you're know, you probably gonna do more than a thousand square feet um, for each treatment that you do. So on a typical home, it's probably closer to maybe 2000 square feet of treatment area. So what that means is you're gonna spend about 20 bucks on this program uh, per customer per year uh, of Scion. And that's at the Scion cost with no rebates, no incentives, nothing like that. That's the strict, you know, uh, agency price on it. So again, it'll, it'll be, there's a good opportunity it's, it's gonna be lower than that even. So 20 bucks a year for that customer, you know, what are you charging per treatment? Um, if you're charging, you know, 70 bucks a treatment and you do seven treatments, uh, gosh, what does that come up to? Um, 490 bucks, something like that. So again, um, right, right around 500 or so and $20 in, in, in uh, Scion cost. Uh, another program here would be go every other month with Scion, um, you know, do maybe four treatments. Uh, that gets your program cost at 1236 per thousand square feet. So again, it's not a lot um, comparatively. Um, again, we talked about the 75 day, um, you know, assurance program. So again, what this can do, you know, if you went out, you know, every other month, um, you get the 75 days. So any retreats in there, will give you the product. Uh, but we do know that science is going to last at least that long at that high rate. So hopefully you save on um, number of visits you have to do. So if you can charge, you know, maybe twice as much for that every other month treatment as you do for the monthly, that's half the visits that you're going out there to visit that customer. So you're saving on you know, gas, you're saving on product, you're saving on labor uh, to do that treatment. So again, could be uh, definitely an opportunity um, for some big savings because really labor and truck and gas and all that, 
are much more substantial than the cost of the product. Um, Going to move right quickly into our True Champions. Uh, what True Champions is is a program. Uh, it's a rebate program for for you guys, the the end users, um, where you can earn rebates on on really pretty much all FMC products. And the good thing is you sign up once for this program. It's fmctruechampions.com. You go in there, you fill out some basic information. Basically, it's your the name of your company, I believe your name, address, phone number, email address. And this isn't uh, designed to send you a bunch of junk emails, anything like that. Uh, I, can, I can assure you uh, it'll be true champions focused. Uh, uh, really, that's it. But again, you sign up once. So if you signed up today, you don't have to sign up next year. You don't have to sign up the year after that. The other good thing is that your any purchases that you make are automatically um, uploaded into um, our system so we can calculate your rebates and you don't have to submit invoices, anything like that. As long as you're purchasing from an authorized distributor, uh, you really don't have to do anything then, hey, if you qualify for a rebate, uh, you can get two rebate checks a year. They'll just show up for you and, and that's it. So again, pretty good program, uh, can save you some dollars on um, on the products. So again, the way this works, there's a couple different levels of it. Um, I am not the expert on, on uh, uh, true champions or also what we call it dynamic rewards, but basically, you know, you get a base rebate and then uh, you can go a higher levels from there. So let's say Scion, the base rebate is 750 per unit. So if you make that base uh, rebate level of purchases, if you get up to silver, now you get 1.25 times that. So it's 750 times uh, 1.25. So maybe that gets you up to, I don't know, nine, ten dollars, something like that off. Uh, so again, your rebates, and that's per unit. So they can really add up. And uh, again, you get a check uh, up to twice a year, uh, depending on the level. <clears throat> this gives you some of the qualifying products. I believe these are a little bit outdated as far as the the rebates because uh, Scion right now is 750, not five. Um, so that's gone up. Uh, but you get the gist. So each of these products from FMC, even some of our herbicides and fungicides, you do earn rebates on. Um, and then to get a base rebate, you have to qualify for $100 uh, in rebates. So that would be 20 units of, uh, not even 20 units of Scion today. So not doesn't take a lot to get a rebate. Um, one other thing I wanted to quickly touch on today, um, you know, FMC has a, a pretty good uh, industry commitment. Uh, you know, Pest Vets is one of the programs that we really love to support. Um, by purchasing any of these products here, uh, a portion of that gets donated back to uh, Pest Vets. And in, um, we usually do that at Pest World. This past Pest World, we were able to present a check for $20,000, thanks to you guys, uh, your purchases, and then also um, the percentage that we give back to, uh, to Pest Vets. So really good um, industry support here and commitment for a great cause, great organization. Any, any questions? Hey, Brian, thanks for um, presenting yeah. such great uh, informative information. Um, let me go check and see what questions have come in. Um, here's one asking, uh, when using Scion, should you avoid plants that pollinators might visit? Yeah, I think um, it does have typical uh, bee language. You know, if the pollinators are ac actively visiting it, then I would say you shouldn't just treat over the top of those pollinators coming in and out, um, maybe target those applications more earlier in the morning or a little bit later in the evening when those pollinators are not you know, busy there pollinating those plants. But really it's that direct you know, spray over the top when a bunch of bees are there, um, not, not, a good, not a good idea. Um, and I think the labels do, do state uh, to avoid that if possible. Thanks, Brian. Um, the next question's asking, would we use Scion along with Intacare? Yeah, so great, great question. Um, it's something I actually forgot to add in here, but um, I think <laughs> a way to help, yeah, help, uh, you know, 
with some of those types of systems, uh, again, they're not going to do anything for the mosquitoes that are there today, right? So you put that out, you know, it's really that next generation that it's going to affect. So absolutely, uh, it's something where you can go out and do a perimeter treatment with Scion, install those into care, you know, out away from the structure um, and uh, let them do their thing. But yeah, definitely a great question. All right, the next one is asking, um, where do we go to sign up for the rewards? Yes, so just got to go to fmctruechampions.com. Um, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's so easy to do. You do it once, you have to do nothing else. And, you know, what we hate is when we go in there, you know, we look at uh, purchases and we can see where a company should have got a rebate, but they're not signed up for the program. You know, we, we don't like to see that, um, you know, we try to, you know, get this out there as much as we can. And, uh, you know, uh, again, it's just something that's, it's a no brainer, uh, pardon that expression, but it, it's just so easy, so simple uh, to do. All right, Brian, the next one's asking, um, is Scion still effective for mosquitoes at the lower rates? And what would be the longevity? Yeah, so good question. Um, so yeah, the high rate, you know, we look at that 75 day assurance. Um, it's a great program, uh, but I do understand that I would say probably the majority of companies are not going to go on a every other month basis. They're not even going to go, you know, um, definitely not going to go quarterly for mosquito control. You guys want to go every month, right? So at the mid rate, of scion so the 0.33 ounces per uh, per thousand or per gallon um, you're going to get easily 45 days of control so works really well in a monthly type program perfect um here's a question asking is scion micro encapsulated Ah, great question. <laughs> so Scion, you know, it's it's the UVX formulation. Uh, this is a proprietary formulation uh, for FMC. Um, so I, I would say I really can't give you all the details on it, but it does have a protected component. So if you think of that as a microcap, um, that, that's probably not a bad way of thinking of it. So you do have a protected component. Um, you do have um, uh, a readily available component as well. So you will get that, you know, uh, quicker knockdown and kill as well as have something that's going to, over time, um, really add more available product to that pest. Okay. The next question is asking, why, why is it important to know the mosquito species you are targeting? Yep. So, so that one again like we talked about a, a little bit on the uh, biology of mosquitoes um, if you know you're dealing with 80s so whether it's aegypti or, or albopictus uh, you know where they rest right they rest down low so you can target your treatment into some of that lower vegetation you know maybe up to 10 feet or so um, and you're going to get you know 90 plus percent of those uh, resting areas where they are um, if it's Culex that you're dealing with, you know, they rest up higher. So if you're just treating the lower vegetation, uh, there's a good chance that you know, your customer walks outside. They may fly down from up where they're resting at 25 feet, bite that customer, and then the customer's mad. And they say, well, okay, your treatment didn't work. You didn't use the right thing or whatever, where all you have to do is say, oh, wow, well, okay, I'm dealing with Culex. Maybe I need to aim a little bit higher. And I know, you know, certain licensings may prohibit from going up too high uh, and treating trees too high up um, but you know that's something that's you know state specific and uh, as far as where you can treat or not so but yeah team higher with Culex uh, and uh, just knowing that difference can, can definitely help you in your uh, your program all right thanks Brian um this next one, I think he's trying to ask, you know, can you use a product in a mist blower or a power sprayer or a backpack? He's yeah, yeah. So, so with Scion, uh, I would say, I don't know, seventy-five percent of the use for mosquito is a mist blower. So, yeah, perfectly fine to do that. Um, you know, you get that really good penetration into you know dense shrubs or foliage. Um, you know, you can get it up a little bit higher that way. Uh, what I'll say about mist blowers, um, 
you know, you want to make sure that you're not going uh, smaller than 50 microns in size um, coming out of that misflow. And I would say, again, 95% of the misblowers out there, they're probably right around between 50 and 75 micron in size, uh, the particles coming out. And that's just important because of drift. You don't want it to go too far away from your target area. So, yeah, I mean, backpacks, same thing, you know, uh, as far as uh, can you do it? Yeah, backpacks are fine. Uh, then also just dragging a hose is fine. And, you know, BNGs, all that, that's that's not an issue uh, with, uh, with Sion. Perfect. Um, this next one's asking, we were thinking of having nine treatments a year in the Dallas area starting in March, okay. using Scion first and alternating with Duraflex the following month. Then Telstar okay. versus say Duraflex or even one guard. And okay. I think they're asking, you know, was that a good protocol? Is that a good? Yeah, yeah, I think that's fine. You know, it's, you know, we look at, you know, Scion and, and you know, one guard has a couple of AIs. I think it has a, a PBO um, and an IGR as well. So, you know, adding the IGR and it, any point in the, in the treatment uh, program is fine. Um, you know, uh, what we've seen with Scion, you don't need it, but it can it can't hurt you to have it in there. And where I think an IGR can help you is if you have a lot of cryptic breeding sites. So let's say you know there's a bunch of tree holes in some of this dense foliage that you can't see uh, where they're breeding. If you get some of the IGR directly in there, sure, that definitely can help you out. Um, and then also I think switching up, um, you know, the the rotation now. Unfortunately, a lot of the actives for mosquitoes today are pretty much all pyrethroids. So I think that IGR can definitely help in, you know, maybe breaking some of the resistance uh, potential. So, yeah, I, I like that as a program. Uh, I think it's great. Um, you know, and I would say if you're going on a, on a monthly basis, uh, you can definitely go high rate of Scion, but you can also get away with the mid rate as well. Okay, thanks, Brian. This next question is asking: Is Scion available in Canada? Ah, uh, Canada. Um, unfortunately, not at this time, no. Nope. So up in Canada, there, there's very limited uh, products. I think right now you have our Dragnet uh, product up there, uh, which does pretty well on mosquitoes, especially on a, you know, every three weeks or, or monthly basis. Uh, I think there's some other products up there as well. Um, but yeah, unfortunately not Scion at this point. Okay, the next question is asking, are there any known issues of pesticide resistance to pyrethroids? Should we be rotating? Yeah, so um, yeah, definitely there are uh, resistance issues out there. Um, I would say there are some with mosquitoes. Uh, most of that comes from really aerial, aerial applications that municipalities do, uh, where they use a lot of permethrin sometimes. Um, you know, out of those uh, aircraft. Uh, and so again, if, if you have an area where a lot of that's being done, yeah, there could be some level of resistance. I would say as far as, you know, folks doing treatments, you know, backyard mosquito sprays, things like that. I don't know if I've ever seen one confirmed uh, report of resistance um, or, or products not working. So, yeah, it's out there. You know, the, the, again, the issue with mosquito right now is there's not a lot to rotate to outside of the uh, pyrethroid class as far as a, a, a PMP or pest control operator doing mosquito work. Now, good thing is on the aerial application side, there there are some other things that they can use, some other uh, classes of chemistry. There's uh, malathion, there's um, dibrome. So there's a couple other things that can help you know, break that cycle. Mm hmm Okay. Um, this next one's asking, are you able to go back over the formulation again, Sonic plus Talstar initially, and then just Sonic on a quarterly basis? Sure. Goes back here somewhere. Yeah, so this was kind of <laughs> a couple of programs, because again, we, we had folks again that said, we don't, we don't want to go quarterly just with Scion, um, you know, or really anything. They didn't want to, you know, they want to see their customer more often than that. Um, you know, mosquitoes are a, a very um, top of mind pest for, for customers. You know, they see them, they get bit by them. So they wanted to go out more often. 
So how can they do that on a, on a good program? Um, and, you know, so really that's kind of what we have here. So you're going to go Scion first, then in between with a couple of tall star applications. Um, what that does, it gets your cost down a little bit as well. Uh, of course, tall star, a little bit less expensive than Scion as far as application. Um, but come back on the quarterlies with Scion and then in between with tall star. Um, that gives them a really solid program. Um, you know, you're going Scion high rate, uh, tall star mid rate. So again, it does um, it does save a little bit on, on the dollars, but we know that Scion is going to last you out to right about there. So you're going to get that full 75 days or so out of it. And even more than that, I mean, I've got data on Scion out a little bit further out to 90 days where it looks good. You know, get still getting 100% kill, but yeah, I think that's a good good program to go with. I do like this one down here as well. This one does a, kind of an every other month with Scion. Then you could definitely fill in between here with something like a tall star or like the other question asked, you know, um, some of the other products that are available out there. Thanks, Brian. Um, this next one's asking, would you be able to guess around how much product would be used for a typical half acre property with a mist blower? Oof, yeah, so a half acre property, so you're, you're really just going to be doing the perimeter, um, depending on what kind of foliage is there. Um, tough to estimate without knowing how much uh, foliage is out there, but I think on a, a, a typical home yard type scenario, so whether it's a quarter acre, you know, 10, 15,000 square feet, you're probably going to use about two gallons. Okay, so if you're getting up to a half acre, you know, you could be up in that three, three and a half or three to four gallon rate. Don't know if that helped or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just hard to tell without the knowing the amount of, uh, you know, foliage that's out there. But if you have to do that whole perimeter, so if you're a half acre, what is that? I don't know, 100 by 200, something like that. So. 600 linear feet of of just around the perimeter if you if you're going to do that so um, if you did 10 feet wide that could be 6,000 feet right there mm -hmm. but again that's you know counting on the fact that there's plants or other things around that perimeter um, so again it's really going to vary but I think the average residential home right around two gallons all right, here's another question asking, is Scion petroleum based? What are the concerns for overspray and drift? Yeah, so no, so that would be a no. Um, and then as far as the concerns for overspray and drift, um, I think if you're, probably the biggest potential for drift would be in something like a mesh flow, because your particle size is getting pretty small. That's why there's that caveat, you know, you can't go below 50 micron because that a, a particle below 50 microns in size has the potential to drift a long ways. So you get above that 50 threshold and they tend to go a little ways but then drop because they're heavy enough to drop out of, you know, wind or, or anything like that that's pushing them. Um, so, you know, it, you know, not anything really different with Scion than again something like a Tall Star as far as you know drift or or, or movement. Um, you know, being you know not necessarily an uh, oil-based product. Um, you know, plants and foliage things like that. You don't really have to worry about them as far as any kind of phytotoxicity, anything like that. Um, so hopefully that answered it. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question asking. Uh, does FMC make any products for ticks, mosquitoes that are in a different class from pyrethroids for rotating? Yeah, great question. Um, I would say right now, um, that answer is is really a no. Um, there's, there's just not a lot of other products out there. Um, and, the, you know, the products that are out there, you know, you've got, you know, Neonix, which, you know, have some issues right now uh, from a regulatory standpoint. Um, you know, there, there are some other chemistries out there. Uh, we just don't have one at this point uh, for, for mosquito and tick. Uh, we do have a newer chemistry for other pests though, which is good uh, for things like grubs and, and turf pests, but doesn't help out with these guys, unfortunately. 
All right, Brian, here's a question asking, um, do you have any recommendations or other material to help with the proper settings on a steel mister with Scion? Um, I can probably get you something on that because the steel backpacks, um, they have, I believe, a couple of different um, volume settings. And I think you can also increase the amount of airflow, um, you know, through the end of the uh, uh, through the nozzle. Um, yeah, I can I can definitely see what I can find on that. Um, they can. I don't know. Did you, did you have my contact information there? I don't even know if I had it online. Um, right um, now we're looking. It, I think it's on the. Was it on your last screenshot? Um, I don't think it was the last actually. Slide. <laughs> No, nope, it wasn't there. Darn it. All right, well, let me do this real quick. Let me uh, <laughs> see if I can pop it on there real quick. Is it just brian.mount at fmc.com? Correct, correct. Mm hmm. Yeah. So they can reach you via email that way. Um, we are getting close to the top of the hour, but let me see if we can squeeze in a couple of more questions. Um, yeah, that doesn't have your contact information right there. Right there. Um, let's see. Are wasp nests good to spray with Scion under eaves to help reduce or even eliminate future nests? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, it'll it'll um, it'll hit them. You know, it, as far as time to kill them, uh, it's going to knock them down for sure. Uh, it's probably going to take. You know, it's not going to be that instant kill like something like a um, uh, you know wasp and hornet you know spray um, out of an aerosol can would do. Um, so I would just say you know give yourself a little time to or a little distance. <laughs> um, you know, because again, it won't be absolutely immediate um, like you see with others. But yeah, you'll have a residual there uh, up under those eaves where if they do try to build new nests, you know, they're going to walk on those surfaces. They're going to pick it up and be affected by it. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. This, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, there, there, we have great data on Scion for other things like spiders as well. Um, and, and ticks, you know, ticks, we've got just fantastic data. Um, you know, out to as much as even 90 days uh, for ticks. Um, the assurance is 75, but um, again, and this is really treating a surface and then putting it outdoors to age, bringing it back in, putting ticks on it after 30, 60 or 90 days and they're all dying. So really good stuff. Uh, spider data as well, really good spider data and uh, really good um, feedback from folks using it uh, on spiders specifically. So yeah, lots of other good best as well. Good. I think we have time for maybe just two more questions. And this next, next one's asking, um, do you have any tips on what areas to spray if a property has very few trees or bushes, mostly just grass and concrete? Yeah. So, you know, in those situations, you know, again, any of the shaded areas for sure. So up under the soffits, you know, if they have porches, maybe up under those porch roofs, you know, um, I would also, in those cases, if they're seeing a lot of mosquitoes and that's kind of the situation you're in where they don't have a lot of shrubs or plantings or, or you know, shady areas for them to rest, you know, is it possible that they're coming from some other water sources close by? Um, you know, maybe a neighbor has something or maybe they back up to a stream or something where a lot of the mosquitoes are coming out of those types of areas. Um, you know, that can make it a little more difficult to treat. Remember, if, if you don't have a lot of area to treat on that property, um, mosquitoes can find you from a couple hundred feet away for sure. So if they're resting in the woods in the back somewhere um, and then finding their way to you. So it, it's going to be a little bit of an investigation there, I think. But, it, you know, if you hit anything that's shaded um, or cool, uh, that's really all you can do at that point. You know, they're not going to be in the, in the grass. They're not going to be in the yard. Um, and then also look for those other areas that could be a problem that maybe can be treated with a larvicide, such as, you know, bodies of water wherever they may be coming from. So. Okay, and I think um, we'll make this our last question, and that is, uh, what type of license do you need to treat for mosquitoes? Yeah, so I think it's going to depend on 
the state. So, you know, if you have a general pest control license, uh, that may be sufficient in certain states. Some may require you to get, um, you know, a mosquito uh, applicator's license. Some may require you to get a, a turf ornamental license, just depending on, you know, what those what those states allow for those different types of treatments. Like a lot of them say, well, you can do it with pest control, you can do it 10 feet outside the foundation. Um, so if there's a tree or a shrub that's 25 feet away in the middle of the yard, you may not really be able to treat that with just a regular pest control license. You may have to have an ornamental license. Uh, it really depends on the state though. Some are easy, some are very, very strict and very difficult. So I would say just check with your, your state regulatory agency to see what each of those licenses uh, allow you to do or not do. All right, well, thank you, Brian, and everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, later today, you will receive a follow-up email that has a recording of the session. And I also wanted to remind folks that Scion is on promotion through the end of this month. So make certain you reach out to your Viserys rep, or you can always go on to Viserys.com uh, to order the product. So again, yep. on behalf of our speaker and Viserys, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.